Stanford University. So right now, this is the last talk of the day before the poster work. Um, I want to announce that after this, we are going to go outside for the group photo. So if you, if you are wearing your uh, ultra-fast X-ray summer seminar T-shirt, that's great. Um, so now we have uh, a slightly different perspective to ultra-fast. This is going to be mostly optics uh, and high harmonic generation, uh, a different approach to generate uh, um, ultra-fast pulses. Uh, Today we have uh, Lou Dimaura coming from Ohio State University. And uh, Lou has done some of the fir very first experiments here at LCLS. And uh, we are all looking forward to your talk. So thanks. Okay. Well, thank you. OK. Can everyone hear me? Is this? OK, well, it's a pleasure being here. I've been here a number of times uh, before. and. When I asked uh, Mariano, what shall I talk about? He said, talk about whatever you want, as long as it has something to do with uh, free electron lasers. So I've been involved in free electron laser physics since the uh, early 90s uh, uh, at Brookhaven when we were kind of developing these SASEs and high gain, high harmonic sources. Uh, we did that at Brookhaven. But the other part of my life is working in a a laboratory, most of my life is working in my own laboratory and doing optical physics, laser physics, and, uh, and now at the second uh, uh, studies uh, using this process of high harmonic generation, which I'll tell you about today, okay? So it's another way of doing, uh, for instance, XUV or soft X-ray spectroscopy, but it's time resolved and it's coherent radiation and it's got this uh, wonderful structure of being able to form sub-femtosecond light pulses. Uh, so that is what I'll, I'll tell you about today. Uh, I'll tell you about the ABCs and I, since this is a school, I, I, I like to, you know, to dive a little deeper into some of the physics behind this, okay? Some of it may be familiar uh, to many of you, but maybe you haven't kind of worked through all the details of the problem, so that's what I'd like to do today. So, um, so my first question for you guys is this. Okay, we heard about the infamous blue slack summer school t-shirt. Here it is. So that, that was 2000. 2007, and notice all the, uh, the bleach stains on it, okay? Uh, so which one do you like better, this or the current red version or cardinal, cardinal version? <laughs> yeah, I like the blue too, obviously. I have a stack of the red t-shirts that are unused that I give to my daughter to sleep in and, and stuff like that. But this one is, is mine. So Nora uh, made a fantastic sh choice. OK, so how we're going to do this today is I, I, I want to start uh, this high harmonic process where you get an intense optical laser, you focus it into a gas jet, you get this radiation coming off, which you see there, this coherent radiation, which are just high harmonics of the field that's driving the process, okay? So it has this characteristic, what we call the plateau, that is the uh, efficiency of the process doesn't seem to depend anymore on the order of the process. And then you see at some point it cuts off the photon yield drops off very rapidly around this 79th harmonic of the radiation field. So we're going to discuss where this comes from physically, okay? And to do that, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is the strong field physics and then uh, develop a semi-classical view of explaining that spectrum along with many other phenomena that uh, we observe in, in, in this regime of uh, interaction. And then I'll show you how the sub-cycle response 
uh, comes out of this physics, and, and, and once you go sub-cycle, then you're inherently at the second, okay? Then we'll talk about the formation of at the second light pulses. You know, what's the prescription? What's the engineering? Uh, and then how do you measure such a short pulse of light? And then I'd like to show you, you examples of doing some measurements, physical measurements using at the second light pulses that are uniquely at the second measurements, okay? They can't be done uh, in any other way except with the type of source I'm, I'm telling you about today. But at the end, I hope you appreciate, I'm not going to talk about X, XFELs, but that the techniques I'm talking about here translate very well onto XFELs. In fact, my group and several other groups, his thrust has been to translate these sorts of measurements onto uh, X-ray free electron lasers, okay? Because our measurement techniques me know how to measure ionizing radiation and know how to measure short pulses of light. We measure at the seconds, but we can measure femtoseconds, okay? So uh, that's the message today and the connection to uh, LCLS. Okay, so since this is a summer school, uh, I'd like to announce that there'll be another school that you guys should be paying attention to. I say will be because the details are still kind of working out. Uh, but um, in March, or over these dates, over a 10-day period, there will be the first international at the second school in Arici, Sicily. Okay, this is a place that holds schools throughout the year. Uh, and, and, and they agreed. So myself and uh, Mauro Nozzoli in uh, Milano are the uh, uh, organizers of this school, and it will be, have a number of lecturers, all of them being the top people in the field of at the seconds, okay? And this hopefully will turn into a regular school every two years. So you guys should pay attention uh, for this school when the announcement comes out on the web, but uh, you can check uh, in, in uh, Arici, there's the uh, Marajana Center uh, that is the host of all these schools, and you might be able to find, uh, you will eventually find information there. Okay? Okay, I, I, I thought it would, uh, so I think uh, Nora showed this plot, but again, I just wanted to find uh, at the seconds, for those of you who may not know at the seconds, at the seconds is smaller than a femtosecond by three orders of magnitude in time. Um, and um, so, um, you know, the atomic, the, this is actually wrong, the atomic unit of time is 25 at the seconds. That's uh, assuming just the, the linear motion uh, in the ground state of hydrogen. But in the Bohr atom, this n number is about 100. 50 attoseconds or so. So what's interesting about attoseconds, besides the fact that they're three decades faster than a femtosecond, is that this is the natural time scale of the electron in matter, in the ground state of matter. So uh, we feel that we now have a probe that could be able to do time resolve studies of the electron motion in matter, not just the heavy nuclei, which femtoseconds does for you. Okay, so now we know uh, what uh, an attosecond is. Now the question is, uh, can I produce an attosecond electromagnetic pulse in the optical regime? So this is kind of your first question. So can I make a laser on my tabletop based on optical, uh, you know, uh, technology to, to make an at the second light pulses. I mean, what do you think of the limitations there? Wavelength. Well, wavelength, uh, yes, but uh, it's, it's the period, right? What is the period of optical radiation, say, from blue to red? It's anywhere from one to four femtoseconds or five femtoseconds. So I can't make an electromagnetic pulse shorter than a period, right? So that is a limitation. The other is, what else do I need? Just, you can think of it however you want in terms of the uncertainty principle or Fourier 
uh, transform, what else do I need in order to make a pulse shorter and shorter in time? A large bandwidth. And the visible itself is not sufficient to supply me enough visible, uh, enough bandwidth, okay? So here's a basic uh, uh, um, prescription then for making sub-femtosecond pulse. Say I want an atomic unit of, uh, of time pulse, okay? That's 25 at the second. So I want a one cycle 25 at the second pulse. Then if I just <laughs> determine uh, the uh, carrier frequency of that pulse, of that period, if that's the period of the light, then I need 7.5 nanometer light, or I need 165 EV uh, carrier frequency for that light, okay? How much bandwidth do I need then? Well, the bandwidth I need is 20 petahertz of bandwidth, okay? The optical spectrum is about a petahertz, a few petahertz. Okay, so I need more bandwidth in the optical regime just in terms of making this uh, atomic unit of time pulse. Then I need to control the phases of the light. We'll talk more about that. But you know, I could have a lot of bandwidth. I mean, this white light is a lot of bandwidth, okay? but it's not generating short pulses of light, not in a regular way, right? The light is incoherent, the phases, therefore, the colors have no phase relationship. And so if I analyze the light, if I had fast detectors coming out of that light bulb, I'm gonna find that it's DC light, but there's kind of noise on it, but that noise is actually structure. That is the different colors interfering constructively or destructively in a completely chaotic, uh, fashion. Very similar to what SASE does, okay? Uh, but uh, so you need the control phases in order to have uh, a transform limited pulse, like the ones we're talking about here. I want a 25 at the second pulse. I need 20 petahertz of coherent bandwidth. That, and to get that coherent bandwidth, I do that by controlling the phases. Okay, then of course the challenge is always, whether you're working femtoseconds or you're working in x-ray, is how do I measure such a short pulse? And we'll talk about that. Okay, so now let's start talking about the classical uh, physics, okay? And I'm not gonna belabor what's going on here, but for many years, um, there have been various observables in strong field physics. So if I shine, optical light on something like the helium atom. Uh, and I have sufficient intensity. We'll talk about what sufficient intensity is. But let's for the moment say it's about 10 to the 15 watts per centimeter squared. Then this helium atom will react in a very nonlinear fashion to this low frequency light. And I'll observe that I'll get very high energy electrons off this atom. Just a single atom, okay? Not, not, not a plasma, it's a single atom. And I would find that this single atom, even though the photons I'm shining on it are kind of like one EV, I'm getting out hundreds of EV electrons, okay? So m if I think about this in, in purely from the standpoint of absorption, this thing has absorbed hundreds in, of photons in order to produce such high energy electrons. And if I look at the radiation coming off this single atom, then I find this high harmonic spectrum, which again, I'm shining in 0.8 uh, micron light, 800 nanometer light, and I'm getting radiation off this atom that extends down into the XUV, okay? In this case, down to something like 10 nanometers. So it upconverted the light from visible to XUV by, again, absorbing many photons, but doing it in a very strange way, right? I mean, uh, you know from just thinking about perturbation theory, I can always calculate out higher order processes, but I'll find that those higher order processes are, are negligible, okay? 
Uh, in fact, numerically, if you do it, you would find that those higher order processes are basically within the numerical noise of your calculation. But this is telling you that there's a plateau here that somehow this atom doesn't care anymore about order. It, all it cares about is generating all this radiation or absorbing all these photons. Okay, uh, then you would also find that you shine in this kind of low frequency light and you can take off more than one electron off the atom. In fact, you can strip it of all its valence electrons. Uh, but we won't, won't be talking about that today. So we knew for the longest time that the uh, strong field physics was very nonlinear. It was non-resonant. It didn't matter if this is red light or blue light or mid-infrared light. The physics seemed to behave in a similar way, in a more universal way. So it wasn't resonances that were being invoked that were important. And then it's non-perturbative. That is, it's a breakdown of perturbation theory. Okay, so let's start with our first metric. Or what do we mean by intense? And so as an atomic physics person, I turn towards the hydrogen atom always and look for my kind of gauges, okay? So that's what we do here. We have the hydrogen atom with the electron sitting in the ground state, a half uh, angstrom uh, from the proton, and I just use Coulomb's law, and I calculate the electric field. And you find that the electric field is 50 volts per angstrom between the electron and proton, okay? And that is the definition of the atomic unit of field. Okay, now I ask, what laser intensity do I need to uh, impose on this atom in order to have an equivalent electric field? And you run through, again, just simple math, and you find out it's 3 times 10 to the 16 watts per centimeter squared. Okay, so that's the, equiv that's the intensity equivalent to an atomic unit of field. Okay, and this intensity is easily achieved by optical lasers, okay? You, you buy them and they, you put a lens in front of them and they produce this. In fact, state-of-the-art lasers uh, produce orders of magnitude higher than this. The LCLS produces orders of magnitude higher intensity at, at a tight focus than this, okay? So these fields of uh, on the order of an atomic unit are easily produced in the laboratory. The question is how relevant is the field? Okay, so with that in mind, then let's start develop classically what is happening here. And this all culminated in about, so strong field physics goes back to the early days before there was a laser, okay? No, it wasn't done in the laboratory, it was done by theorists, okay? Uh, but then when the laser came about, immediately kind of people started to focus these lasers down and stick things in front of them and seeing all sorts of nonlinear behavior out of, out of these uh, uh, systems, okay? And, and this field, again, was uh, very, very active, still very active, but uh, observing many new effects that somehow couldn't be connected for a long time. They could be calculated often, but they couldn't be connected in terms of kind of what's the universal response of matter to this strong electromagnetic field. Let me also qualify here so we're clear that what I'm talking about today is all non-relativistic uh, uh, behavior. The intensity, this atomic unit of intensity, it doesn't produce, the electron does not approach the rest mass uh, uh, the, or the speed of light, okay? So this is all non-relativistic uh, physics, assuming that I don't think about anything with the core and so on and what's happening close to the core. Okay, so uh, what we do then um, uh, is uh, think about an electron, a free electron, and we impose an electromagnetic field on it, okay? And now uh, what I'll do is how does that electron react? Well, I'll write down the classical equations of motion. So I say F equals MA, which equals EQ, 
okay? And E is an oscillating field, okay, which I, I write down there. And then just take the derivative, I can write down the velocity, take the second derivative, I write down the position, right? And solve those equations. If I get this uh, a velocity and cycle average it, then I come up with this ponder mode of energy that Nora referred to this morning, okay? And that ponder mode of energy is proportional to the uh, field strength squared, or the, it's linear in the intensity, and goes as one over the frequency squared. So here I, I, I write it down. So the important scaling parameters is that this ponder mode of or quiver energy, so it's just this motion, right, of the free electron in the electromagnetic field is proportional to lambda squared um, times i, uh, and the displacement of the electron is proportional to um, lambda squared times the field strength, okay? And just to put numbers on that so you get a feel for it. So if I take this red light that I'm showing you on the helium atom, and I told you it was about 10 to the 15 watts per centimeter squared, so it's actually less than uh, this uh, atomic unit of field, which was 10 to the 16. But if I calculate this ponder mode of energy, I find out it's 60 volts, okay? If I think about the helium atom, uh, its valence electron is only bound by 24 volts, okay? So this ponder mode of energy is actually larger than uh, the binding energy. It's certainly larger than the photon energy, which is on the order of an EV, and it's even larger than the binding energy. The displacement of the electron uh, th as it quivers is on the order of 25 angstroms, okay? And you know the ground state of helium is about an angstrom. So the size of this quiver is much larger than the atomic ground state, okay? So these are really significant uh, 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 values. Now, as Nora was talking about uh, and, and why the field strength itself alone is, is not sufficient to understand the interaction is that uh, the, this scales as lambda squared or one over omega squared. When you're in the X-ray regime, this number becomes negligible, okay? And the quiver motion of the electron becomes negligible. It's only in the optical regime at these sorts of intensities that these terms become meaningful and significant in terms of, of, uh, of dominating the ionization dynamics. So I want you for at least the next few slides to think in these ponder motive units. So it's, the ponder motive energy is proportional to intensity. I shine light on an atom or molecule of a certain intensity, so I can always associate a ponder motive energy associated with that light pulse, okay? And we'll see if we think in ponder motive, intense, uh, in ponder motive units, then the physics starts looking very universal, right? And that's always, at least to me, and I think to most of us, the beauty of physics is the fact that when you look at things in the right way, they become invariant to all these parameters. And now it all becomes very clearer or clearer uh, by looking at it in, in, in kind of an invariant way. Okay, so we have those Newton's equations, okay? And now let's do a few calculations, okay? So what I have is an electromagnetic pulse here. Say here's the field I have drawn here. Um, I can now place an electron with zero energy, say at a particular phase of the field, okay? Um, as Nora alluded to, we can think of this in terms of tunnel ionization. I'm not gonna talk about tunnel ionization here. It's a rather complex issue, uh, even somewhat controversial how to think about uh, tunneling in an AC field, okay? But for the moment, for this description, because this is how people do discuss it, we'll think about it in terms of uh, placing it in the field by some tunnel ionization process. Okay, this model that we're gonna look at now 
is referred to as the simple man's mo model. And he has a number of papers that uh, developed that model, model in the late 80s. Okay, so I write down my equation of motion. Here's my velocity. And what do I notice when I write down the velocity of this electron? Uh, it has uh, an oscillating term, cosine omega t. This is the quiver that motion of the free electron in a linearly polarized electromagnetic field. And then I get a constant that depends upon the phase at which I drop the electron in the field, right? So this phase here is just the phase at which the electron found itself in the field, or I placed it in the field, okay? And you have a term here, which is the initial velocity. And for tunnel ionization, you make the uh, assumption that the initial velocity is zero because the electron, as it finds itself on the outer turning point of the barrier, is basically at zero velocity. Okay, so that's the assumption that goes into the simple man, and now we can have predictions for the simple man. Okay, so again, here's our velocity, has a quiver and drift. Okay, in the experiment, we don't detect the quiver. The quiver is adiabatic. Uh, the I shine a pulse of light on an electron, the electron quivers up, but then when the pulse goes away, it quivers back down. So it gives its field energy, its quiver energy back to the field. But what I do detect in a short pulse is this drift velocity. Okay, that's what I actually measure on my detector. So I can write down the energy for this and I get this, I'm writing it in, in ponder motive units. I get twice UP times cosine of squared of the initial phase. Okay, so if the electron uh, is born at the extreme of the field, at pi over two, then this term is zero. Okay, so at the extreme of the field, the electron drifts away with zero energy. But at the extreme of the field, the tunneling rate, which is written down here, is maximum because it's exponential in the field strength. Okay? So what I should expect from the simple man are lots of electrons at zero energy. If I look at the node of the field, then this term is maximum cosine squared phi is one, and therefore the electron energy should be twice the pond mode of energy. But at the node of the field, the uh, tunneling rate is zero, right? So I now uh, get a prediction that I should have lots of electrons at zero, zero at two UP. That sets my bounds. And now if I kind of write down the exponential behavior of the tunneling rate, then I expect to see s some spectrum like that. It's exponentially decaying between zero and two UB. So that's the simple classical prediction. Ah, um, there's also quantum analogs to this that you guys are you know, free to look at. Uh, uh, and by Keldish, Faisal, and Reese, I give the references here. And this is a very well, uh, highly cited paper that describes AC tunneling, which people refer to the, as the ADK model of tunnel ionization in a strong field. So now you go look at an experiment, right? You measure electrons, you go in the laboratory, you shine an intense pulse, and what do you see? So here's the absolute electron energy. Here's the energy. I just took the intensity and converted it to ponder motive units, energy, and then put my ponder motive uh, scale up here, okay? Uh, what you notice is that I see lots of peaks, first of all, in this electron spectrum, which I don't want to really discuss in detail, but this is the well-known effect of above threshold ionization that was discovered in 1978 by my colleague, uh, Pierre Agostini. Um, I see lots of electrons, though, beyond 2UP. So the simple man doesn't seem to work here. Um, its prediction of a kind of a upper bound of 2UP is violated by xenon at 30 terawatts uh, 
in a kind of near infrared field. UP here is about three volts in this case. Okay. Okay, forget this gamma since I'm not going to talk about it. But here, if I look at helium at one petawatt per centimeter squared, now the simple man looks okay. I mean, it looks like the electrons are all between zero and two UP. So the simple semi-classical model seems to work. Well, if I look at helium at one petawatt, I know that UP is about 50 volts, okay? The difference is, the difference in this semi-classical model that I want you to just to, to uh, walk away with here without too much justification. What matters is that this ponder motive energy is greater than the binding energy, say, of the valence electron. If that condition is fulfilled, then these semi-classical models of kind of sub-cycle behavior work, okay? And that's not often met. Okay, it's certainly not met in the X-ray regime with the type of intensities that can be produced by X-ray free electron lasers. Okay, and it's barely met in the visible regime uh, by intense lasers. Okay, uh, so you might want to look at that electron spectrum in the case that failed and say, well, why are there electrons beyond 2UP? In fact, if I look at that helium spectrum and I plot it on a semi-log scale, I find out that there are electrons beyond 2UP, okay? So why is that? So let's, again, turn to this kind of classical treatment. Okay, so here, again, I'm just plotting uh, position versus time. So I'm just showing you some uh, trajectories of plopping an electron in the field at a certain phase, okay? Okay, so we plot the electron at this phase of the field. And what I see is that the electron oscillates, it quivers, okay? But it also has this constant slope, which is the drift velocity, right? That depends upon the failure. So all this electron does is this, and moves out to infinity, okay? Let's look at this phase. Okay, at this phase of the field, the electron simply, in, neglecting Coulomb or any other interaction, classically all that happens is this. Right, the electron just oscillates and returns if I have constant uh, intensity or constant amplitude in my field. Okay, let's look at a more advanced phase. At this phase, the electron quivers and drifts, but the initial quiver motion opposes the direction of the drift. And so what this electron does is, okay, so, it quivers out to infinity, but in a half cycle or thereabouts or in a cycle, it returns to the core, okay? And once it returns to the core, it can additionally uh, have an additional interaction uh, and gain more energy. So I didn't say what was absent in the, I mean, I told you that the simple man seems to work in predicting the electron spectrum uh, and other times doesn't. More importantly, in terms of coming up with this universal view of how harmonics come about, how electrons come about, the simple man tells you nothing, gives you no prediction for high harmonic radiation. There's no way you could get a dipole to generate radiation within this semi-classical treatment of the, uh, of the simple man. But in this model, because I interact with the core, I can have the uh, addition of a dipole that gives rise to radiation, okay? We'll see that in a moment. So here's the uh, key, uh, what I call here, the second approximation to the simple man, okay? Is this semi-classical rescattering, or what people also probably more better known as the three-step model. Okay, and this was uh, a model that was proposed by 
uh, our group in, in collaboration with Ken Kulander and Ken Schaefer and independently by Paul Corkum in, uh, in Canada. Uh, and here's the physics. The physics is high energy electrons, high energy photons, and we'll continue to analyze this in terms of harmonics, comes from this re-collision event, okay? And so this electron core interaction occurs in about a half cycle or thereabouts. So you immediately see that this type of interaction gives rise to something that sh gives rise to dynamics that are shorter than a femtosecond, okay? And this is why we, as you'll see, we can generate at the second light burst, okay? The electron gains field energy. The maximum, this is all from classical analysis, right? The maximum is 3.17 times the ponder mode of energy. So remember, we looked at that first high harmonic spectrum. It had this plateau followed by a cutoff. The prediction of this model then is that the cutoff will always occur at 3.17 UP plus whatever the binding energy is of the, of the electron, okay? The binding energy often is negligible. It's small in comparison to UP, okay? And as I said, this physics in, is inherently subcycle. So again, I'm just gonna keep driving this picture home to you guys, okay? Here it is. The electron tunnels through the barrier at some phase of the field. How the electrons get distributed in the field are determined by this exponential behavior of the tunneling uh, rate, okay? But for this electron, I place it in the field at this phase here. It finds itself on the outer turning point of the barrier, okay? It gets picked up by the field, it propagates, so here's uh, um, electric field strength, this is the position, and the electron deviates out, and about a half cycle comes back to the core. When it comes back to the core, the field is different, right? In this case, when the electron comes back to the core, it's actually at a field, a, a, a node of the electric field, which means it's at a maximum in the vector potential of the field, right? And now that electron comes back, during that time, it's accelerating in the field, right? The, it's the world's smallest uh, uh, LINAC, okay? Over, you know, uh, less than a femtosecond, the electron gets accelerated over, you know, a few angstroms, okay? That wasn't a comparison, though, the XFELs. Uh. <laughs> and when it does come back, it has some probability then to recombine back to its ground state and emit a photon that's a higher energy photon than this simple, you know, fundamental field, this optical field that's driving it, okay? So that's how high harmonics come about in this picture here. So here it is. The electron is uh, tunnel ionizes, accelerated by the field, comes back at the core at this phase and then emits a photon. And it does this from half period to half period, right, in this picture. So this radiation is completely coherent. Okay, this is like the cartoon, right, of uh, over a half cycle of what's going on. The electron accelerates, comes back, recombines back to its ground state, and gives off a photon. And within this classical analysis, and I encourage you guys to do it, you'll find that um, you get all these important cl classical uh, quantities or predictions that fit very well to um, of, uh, uh, observations. So different class, the classical trajectories have different release times, different propagation times, we'll see that in a second, different return times, and different energies, okay? So this this is classical mechanics, you know, you may question where does this, photo, this structure I told, showed you about, right, this comb of harmonics come from? Well, it is a classical model, okay? And what matters here is that 
uh, I need to control these wave packet dynamics. This is a wave packet, not just this cartoon, right? I need the control. I use this wave packet to control the electron dynamics in such a way that. Remember, we said in order to form a short pulse, I, I not only need bandwidth, but I need controllable phase such that I can uh, uh, add the colors up in, in the optimal coherent manner. And uh, this wave packet is the key. Okay, let me start this and I'll, I'll, I'll talk as it's winding up here. So, you know, Pierre Agostini and I often talk and we talk and talk about the physics of all this stuff. And then we realize, like, why do we need quantum mechanics for anything, okay? I mean, everything seems classical, okay? So I want to show you there is quantum mechanics in this. Uh, and so this is like a golden oldie movie. This is Ken Coolander and I made this up in, like, 1995, so it's like on... Turner's, you know, classic movies or something like that. But this is the neon atom. This is a quantum calculation in a linearly polarized field. This is a numerical solution. That grid is 300 atomic units by 120 atomic units. That's only part of the calculation. And this is the ground state of neon. So that thing is going up to the sky, right? That's the, uh, uh, it's the amplitude squared. And now the field turns on. I'm going to try and stop this. OK. And what you see, so you see something very strange, right? You're always taught, taught to think about the uh, uh, symmetry of the wave function. This wave function now in the field looks very asymmetric, right? There's a lot of amplitude lying out in the continuum. And it's all on one side of the atom. Okay? But this, this movie, this oscillation, only so far has run a half cycle. So the symmetry is broken by, by the field itself. But more importantly, this wave packet here that you see looks very much like a wave packet if you saw, just solved the DC problem in, of tunnel ionization, okay? just from your kind of basic quantum mechanics with boundary conditions. Okay? you would find that the wave packet on the outer turning point of the uh, barrier looks very similar to this sort of uh, Gaussian uh, um, amplitude that you see here. So let me make the movie run. Now you see the wave packet did exactly what my semi-classical model said it would do. The wave packet goes out, and it was driven back in the next half cycle. And now you can see all the kind of quantum behavior, right? All the interference of the wave that's going on here as it scatters off the core. If you analyze this movie carefully enough, you can see all the sorts of change in a momentum of the electron as it's scattering off the core. But this movie is very indicative quantum mechanically of what has happened, uh, you know, what this classical model shows. So I'm going to let this movie now just run. Oop. Well, I'm not going to let it run because it takes, let me see if I can go back and play it from a point and advance it. Try that again. OK, I think now it plays one more time. The wave packet tunnels out. It's driven out, comes back. Now you start seeing all the interference term. And it propagates forward in the forward direction. But likewise, new probability is being uh, promoted at the next half cycle, so you can, right, it has this half cycle periodicity. Okay. All right, so here's another question. So if this ion is, or this um, um, electron dynamics occurs every half cycle, 
then what would be your, if you just did a simple Fourier transform of this, uh, forget the phase, okay? You assume the fa phase is zero, okay? What would be the spectrum of the photons, the high harmonics that you would get from, the, from a simple Fourier transform? So you have something that's in, in, in time periodic at twice the frequency. So what would the f it look like in the frequency domain? Two omega. So that's what you see in this spectrum, right? So I didn't tell you this. This comb is separated by two h bar omega for a, you know, a, a single color field. Okay, driving it. Okay, so you only get odd harmonics. And you can argue this by parity. I mean, but that, there was the simple mathematical description of why harmonics are separated, uh, are only emitted at odd harmonics. Okay, so here's the second question. If the harmonics come out at two omega, how about the electrons? Because every rescattering event, right, when this electron comes back, it can recombine the minute photon. It can elastically scatter, and you know, you detect that electron after it's undergone, or it could do nothing for, for that matter. But what would you expect in terms of the periodicity of the electron spectrum? Two omega, omega, three omega. It's okay. Th this one, actually, I got a PhD student during an exam stuck on this one. Okay. The answer, oddly enough, is omega. So why is that? I mean, if this event is, a, if this ionization is happening at two omega, why do I see periodicity in the electron spectrum of omega? Okay. I'll give you guys a chance to maybe try and answer that one. So something in the ionization is obviously driving it at omega, not to omega. Different electron momentum, right? I only detect electrons in this direction, say with my detector, or in this direction. Okay? So in that picture, then the vector potential has changed sign. So I detect here, but I only see the ones at omega. I detect here, I only see the ones at omega. But now, here's the next part. If I collect all the electrons, and I can do that, I can use some detector that integrates. I still see omega. Okay. The, re the reason is, well, you can work out the simple Fourier transform. There's a phase factor in there of, of uh, the period over two. Okay. Uh, but the simple way is that when I add them, it's an incoherent addition. So I always get omega out of that problem too or well, out of that detector too. So the ATI is always at omega in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a one color field. Okay, that was a tough one, I must admit. Although the last student I asked, so I asked this question 10 years ago in, uh, I was uh, uh, the opponent uh, for a PhD thesis in Lund, Sweden, okay. Uh, I asked the student this question. It was actually, I asked this question because I was killing time. It was like I, I ran out of questions and okay, there was still, I, they told me I should examine the student for an hour. And I asked this question and the student couldn't answer it and like it went on and on and on. And then the student's advisor came over to me and said, gee, I never thought about that either. So 10 years later, in fact, like last year, I was on one of her other students' exam, and I asked this question, and he answered it immediately. <laughs> okay, 
So uh, I, now I want to look at the, so this question of phase, phase and, and harmonic generation, let me show you from a single atom standpoint where the phase comes from. It's a rather curious type of phase. It's almost like a dispersion, but dispersion at a quantum level. Okay, you usually think about dispersion in terms of right macroscopic quantities, in terms of susceptibility and so on. But this is actually a, a single atom dispersion of the electron wave packet. So again, we have, we're going to just look at classical trajectories. Here's the electric field, red dotted. Um, so I'm going to now show trajectories, position versus time. And then down here, we're going to plot the energy of the electron when it returns, okay? All, all classical mechanics. Okay, there's one trajectory. The electron propagated out and the half cycle came back to the core at this phase of the field. And we find that the electron, when it returned, uh, had a velocity that gave rise to some photon or electron, well, photon in this case. Let's think about this. We're talking about this in terms of harmonics, okay? So it emitted a photon of this energy. Okay, here's another trajectory. I just released the electron a little earlier in time, uh, gave rise to this purple, it came back, and now you can see it actually had a higher energy, okay? It propagated a little bit longer than the first trajectory. Do this again, and uh, now I, I, I get a different return time and a different energy, do it again, and I get a different return time and a higher energy, and you notice that this is an, a time, an emission time I'm plotting here, so I'm uh, plotting frequency versus uh, time, which is essentially a dispersion, okay? And the slope of this long, the slope of, of these, if I draw a straight line through there, is the chirp associated with this dispersion. And in this case, I would say the chirp is positive, okay? The blue, uh, yeah, this is at lower energy. So this was my brilliant color coding. Blue means lower energy, red means higher energy, okay? So the, the lower frequencies come first and the higher frequencies come later. So kind of, this is like a normal dispersion, right? Right, now I'm gonna actually release electrons within the same quarter cycle, but at a little earlier time. Okay, and what I find is those electrons propagate for a longer time, okay, have a larger amplitude, and when they come back, they give rise to these electrons, uh, these uh, photon energies, and you, the first thing to note is that it gives rise to similar photon energies as the first uh, group of trajectories, but the sign, the chirp of these uh, um, photons are opposite in sign, okay? So uh, we refer to these in, in strong field physics as the short trajectory and the long trajectory, which is just based on their propagation time. Okay, so um, I can now do the full classical calculation, which I show you here. So here I'm plotting the initial electron phase, the phase at which it was released, versus the return energy of that phase. And I get this curve here. Again, at short uh, times, this is the short trajectories, this is the long trajectories, and these electrons, or these, this, uh, return energy reaches a maximum. And what is that maximum? That maximum, again, is 3.17 UP, okay? So that, that, that gives me bounds between, for harmonic emission, that they, I should see harmonics between kind of IP plus uh, 3.17 UP, okay? And so I compare that, uh, make a real comparison, right? This spectrum was recorded at a certain intensity and so on. And I compare this plateau followed by a cutoff to this here. 
And indeed, if you analyze this experimental measurement, this point here is like 3.17 UP. So the simple, this kind of classical mechanics really does predict this cutoff uh, reasonably well. In fact, it does more than that. Here's the helium spectrum we were looking at later. Remember we said that the simple man model gave us electrons between zero and two UP. If I allow the electron now to elastically scatter off the core, I find that there's a new upper bound to the electron, and that's 10 times the ponder motive energy. And if you look at these electrons here, they are actually bound by 10 UP. So this very simple semi-classical behavior is really kind of picking out very important quantities in the observation. And more importantly, it's unifying them, right? This one event explains the high energy electrons. It explains the high energy photons. And it will also explain multiple ionization, the knocking off of multiple electrons. So it really is a very intuitive model that quantum mechanically, you, you know, you can reproduce uh, uh, by, by doing the calculations, but kind of seeing the physics, the underlying physics in the quantum model is often very difficult. Okay, uh, so what is the next qu question here? Okay, so I say if for the electron spectrum, the electron comes back, interacts with the core, and now uh, can produce electrons as high as 10 UP. So what type of scattering, elastic scattering, could give rise to the highest energy? Is it a forward scattering event or back scattering event? What, what, what collisional process gives rise to the largest change in momentum? I mean, think about your backscattering. backscattering. So backscattering is, in fact, the uh, event that gives rise to these 10 UP electrons. In fact, if we were to kind of analyze that quantum model, you would see as that electron wave packet came in and scattered off the core, gave rise to all this um, you know, interference, quantum uh, interference, you'll see that there's actually Prob uh, probability moving backwards against the field. And if you analyze it, those are the electrons that have the highest energy. Okay? All right, one la last thing about uh, electrons before we start just moving straight into the photons. Uh, because the electrons are always, if I'm interested in the single atom, Electrons are, are a lot easier to look at because I'm really looking at the response of the atom. The electrons I observe, detect, are coming off the atoms. Okay? If I look at harmonics, usually it also, because the, the photons have to propagate through the medium, also uh, incurs the macroscopic part. So not only do I have to think about the quantum mechanics, I also have to be, think about Maxwell's equations. Okay, here uh, I look at the electrons because I think it conveys the point uh, much easier. So I just want to show you the, the effect of this ponder motive potential here. Very simple exercise. So we said this ponder motive energy is proportional to lambda squared and linear in I. Okay, and the, 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 the take home message is because of this event, okay, if I can increase UP, I increase the energy of the particles. And here you see electron spectrum of helium at red light uh, at three different intensities. Okay, and it does what we said it should do. It, as I increase the intensity, I get higher and higher energy electrons in off this. Okay, again, a, a, a completely amazing, and if you want to talk about extreme nonlinear optics, I think this example and the example seen in other laboratories is about as extreme of nonlinear optics as you get. 
In fact, our semi-classical model says that it's so extreme that I don't have to even think about photons anymore. Right? I just think about fields. Okay, so I, I produce, as I raise the intensity, I produce higher and higher energy particles. So now let's look at it in this kind of invariant way. I said uh, UP is proportional to intensity, so I can now normalize this in terms of the ponder mode of energy for each of those different intensities. Okay, so here's what we get. Uh, now you can see the distributions look pretty similar. The simple man, 0 and 2 UP, all three distributions, I normalize these at, at 0, right? Uh, the rate is changing, of course, okay? But I normalize them. You can see between 0 and 2 UP, they look very similar and uninteresting, okay? I, I get a lot of electrons between 0 and 2 UP. Then I get this long plateau, okay? In this case, uh, I don't extend them but they should go out to 10 UP by the classical model. We just didn't do these experiments with enough signal to noise to see out to 10 UP. But you can see this plateau behavior, and in our language now, this plateau is coming from that, right? The elastic scattering, okay? That's the physics. But what's interesting here in this universal view, which seems to capture the overall shape of the distribution, is in this uh, universal view, the more energetic particles, that is the plateau, the rescattering, is more effective at low intensity than it is at high intensity. So if I raise the intensity, I actually decrease the amount of rescattering. In fact, within this picture, if I would raise the intensity to infinity, this atom will start looking like the, the simple man. Everything will be between 0 and 2 UP. That is, it would seem that rescattering shuts off. So there's the question. Why, <laughs> Why is it that as the intensity increases, rescattering is less efficient? So think about this purely as elastic scattering. Think, you know, what you know from kind of your modern physics courses as an undergrad. Why, why is this rescattering becoming less efficient as I increase the intensity? Where there was another voice. Uh, it's not. That's right. So it's, it's really the effect of Rutherford scattering, right? So let's, I mean, now we go back to our kind of undergraduate textbook, right? Rutherford scattering is I come in with a certain velocity. I scatter off uh, uh, some attractive potential in this case, and uh, the electron uh, has a change in its momentum, okay? But its energy stays constant. And if I look at this as a function of velocity, I find that the cross-section for the elastic scattering drops off as 1 over the scattering energy squared, right? That is, as, this, <coughs> as the electron energy uh, goes to higher and higher uh, energy, then the, I can think about this in terms of a de Broglie wave, the frequency of the de Broglie wave becomes so high that basically it doesn't see the potential. And so when I do the experiment in a strong field, as I change the intensity, we already said we're increasing UP. We're giving more and more drift velocity to the electron, right? And as the electron returns, its cross-section is dropping. So this would, again, really, in the limit of infinite intensity, I would expect there would be no signs of rescattering from, from this system. And in fact, you, you can observe that. That's what you're seeing in that helium experiment. It's all very consistent. Just to quickly show you the effect of the wavelength, which is a much more powerful knob, first of all, because this ponder mode of energy is quadratic in the wavelength. 
but more importantly, it's continuous, and we won't discuss why that is. But here's harmonic spectrum, okay? Now we're looking at harmonics, and we just change the wavelength, that constant intensity, from uh, something near visible to something in the mid infrared. So I make the photon smaller and smaller, right? It's, at first, it seems kind of counterintuitive. Uh, I make the photon smaller and smaller, and the emitted photons get higher and higher, okay? And uh, that's just the effect of this ponder mode of energy, okay? It's just the effect that as my wavelength gets longer and longer, the period gets longer and longer, and the electron has more and more time to accelerate in the field. And when it comes back, it gives that energy up as a photon. Okay, so this is a rather dramatic, and this is the method now that people are attempting to use these high harmonics to get above a kilovolt in energy. Okay, so let's continue on this at the second adventure here. So, um, Let's talk about it from the standpoint, again, simply a Fourier transform. So this is like just a math exercise that I did. But I wrote it down in terms of uh, harmonics. So I write a discrete model here. I say that the intensity of the emitted spectrum as a function of time is just the uh, coherent sum of the amplitudes of different colors. Those are harmonics. Q is the label of the order of the harmonic, which is odd in this model, okay? Uh, it's just the sum of odd harmonics that have an amplitude, and I give them a phase, okay? This uh, phi of Q, okay? And so, uh, and this phase here, well, um, I have this phase, definitely. let's forget that for the moment. Okay, so here is the, the uh, mathematical model, I just have monochromatic waves of different colors of odd harmonics. So here we have the 13th, 15th, 17th, 19th, 21, and 23rd harmonics. So what do I have here? I have six harmonics of six different frequencies. And now I set the phase, this is the phase here, I set the phase to zero. And I just take the phase and the amplitude information and I Fourier transform that and so what I get is a periodic train of, of pulses in time that are shorter than a femtosecond. So you can see that's, trying to see that myself, that's, uh, uh, this is in femtoseconds, not in period. So that's a half a period. I wish this green point uh, actually had light coming off. But here's uh, two harmon uh, harmonics emitted in time at two times the frequency, okay? Okay, so I get this train. All right, here's another question. I keep the amplitude exactly the same. I have six frequencies. And now the phase as a function of energy is this linear phase. What do you predict is gonna happen in the time domain? So in the time domain, we saw when I had the phase set to zero, I get the emission of a train of pulses in time that is separated by two omega, right? Half the, half the optical period. If I have this blue phase now, what will it look like? What's the phase difference now? The phase difference is still a constant, right, between these different colors. When it was zero, the phase difference was a constant. It was zero. The phase difference now is a constant, okay? It's not zero, but it's a constant. So if I Fourier transform this, nothing happens, except I get a change in time of the train, okay? So it just advances or, or delays based upon the sign of, the fa of this linear phase. So that's an uninteresting phase, right? But if I have a more complex phase, a phase where the, the phase difference between two colors, that is del delta uh, phi, is n depends upon the order, then I start destroying my pulses, and that's shown here. So here I added 
different amount of quadratic phase. And now you can see the pulse goes from this nice train to something that starts breaking up. So controlling this is key, is crucial. So let, let me tell you now how we engineer the pulse in the laboratory. So we shine the light on the atom. The atoms are actually reasonably high density, like Tor, you know, 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17 atoms per cc. Okay, it's rarefied enough that it's not solid density, uh, but it's high enough density and plus the ionization that's being driven that Maxwell's equations do matter, okay? Uh, but I shine the light on these atoms and I get this typical harmonic spectrum. These are calculations, by the way, okay? So here's a harmonic spectrum when it's plateau and here's the cutoff. The cutoff is at you know, 3.17 UP in these uh, uh, calculations. Uh, here's the phase, okay? Uh, this is actually the quantum calculation, not the uh, classical calculation, but you can see it looks just like the classical calculation. The phase has uh, long trajectories and short trajectories. You see they converge here uh, at some value. What is that value? It's 3.17 UP, just like the classical model says. But of course, in the quantum calculation, you can actually have uh, phase behavior beyond 3.17. There's nothing classical about the quantum uh, calculation, okay? But the amplitude is going to zero, un unfortunately. But uh, so you have these two phases here, okay? And now I take this amplitude and this phase, and I Fourier transform this, just like we were doing earlier with the kind of monochromatic model, right? Uh, and I get this train of pulses in time. You can see it's sub-cycle, but not very nice looking pulses, right? All right, uh, why is that? Well, uh, first of all, I know from, my, from theory that the very lowest order harmonics, the phase is quite erratic, okay? And so, um, I don't want the low order harmonics, and, and, and mostly I'm not interested too much in the low order harmonics anyway, okay? I'm interested in the higher frequency radiation coming from uh, the source. So I want to just get rid of the low order harmonics. So you just block them. I'll tell you in a moment how you block them, but you just block them with a filter. So you just spectrally filter out low order harmonics. If I do that, Okay, which is shown here, here's the amplitude. The amplitude now cuts off all the harmonics below 11, say, okay? Uh, and now I Fourier transform what's left. I get something that looks a little better in time, but still not great. I wouldn't call those uh, nice uh, transform limited pulses. But if you're someone who works in optics, you should immediately recognize there's a real culprit here in terms of trying to control the dispersion. And that is, I have two phase behaviors that have the opposite sign, okay? It's hard enough to deal with phase behaviors that have the same sign, but if I have opposing phase behavior, it really makes it a nightmare. So uh, these, as you can see here, for instance, this harmonic has a contribution from the long trajectory and the short trajectory, okay? And the dispersions are opposed. So I like to get rid of one of them, okay? And uh, the way we do that is we actually prefer the short trajectory. And that has to do with the Maxwell's equation aspect, which I won't discuss here. But the short trajectories have a longer coherence time and therefore um, are um, easier to phase match and generate more of those photons with a lower divergence. So here's a very well-known experiment that was done in uh, Florence. Um, so here are high harmonics in the far field and this was basically a Mach Zender type of experiment. They got the harmonics, they, they split them, and then measured the coherence uh, uh, time in the spectral domain, okay? And 
Hopefully you can see that there's this very bright spot in the center with this halo around it. Okay, and you can, can you see these interference fringes in these uh, patterns? Okay, so what they did in this experiment is they moved one of the arms of the Mach Zender interferometer and uh, measured the coherence time of these fringes that they're seeing. And what they found, this was really one of the first connections of, of this long and short trajectory uh, to physical observation. What they observed is that the central spot had a much longer coherence time than the diffuse stuff on the outside, okay? And at that time, they, they then recognized that the more divergent light was the long trajectory and the central spot is the short trajectory, okay? And so this made it easy as an experimentalist to kind of pick one over the other. Okay, so I want to pick the short trajectory so I put a pinhole in my, my apparatus, and I let the short trajectory through and block out a lot of the long trajectory, okay? And now I'm left with this phase behavior, this spectrum, and this train in time. And so now I get short pulses that are approaching, you know, the atomic unit of time. Okay, this is uh, an important um, reference that actually led to this measurement done by N. Louis group at that time, in uh that predicted the theory of how this might happen. And then they went to Florence and did this experiment. And then in 2001, the Saclay team, <coughs> led by Pierre Agostini, observed the first formation of at the second pulse trains. So um, here's how we do it, or how some of us do it. Uh, we get optical light, we shine it. We shine it into some gas jet containing some inert gas, like argon atoms, okay? At that point, it, you get this spectrum here with this type of time structure. Uh, we then add a filter to get rid of the low harmonics, so in this example, I just use aluminum. Aluminum starts passing. Thanks. Aluminum starts passing uh, above 15 volts, so I get rid of I get rid of the uh, low harmonics. Uh, now the pulse train looks a little better, and then I put a pinhole. And if you're building an apparatus that you know you're trying to do. VUV radiation, you naturally add a pinhole anyway for uh, differential pumping in your vacuum apparatus. You add a pinhole and you clean up your pulses and you get this nice pulse strain. All right, uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about this in detail, but you can make, instead of pulse strains, you can make isolated pulses. Okay, and this was also demonstrated in 2001 by Ferenc Krauss's group at that time uh, in Vienna, okay, um, that um, basically you can remember this, this process is periodic at 2H, uh, 2 omega. And if I want to get a very short pulse, a single pulse, what I want to do is confine the emission to just a half cycle. So the way Krauss did this uh, originally was he just used a very short driving field that only oscillated for like two cycles or one and a half cycles. And he confined the emission to um, a single uh, half cycle, thanks, a single half cycle by using amplitude gating. But you can also use lots of other tricks, in fact better tricks, uh, things like polarization gating or using bichromatic fields. Here's Here's a cartoon uh, that uh, is from this review article, and I, I encourage you to look at this review article, uh, where you have a polarization-dependent uh, uh, phase uh, in, in your field, such that the light is only linear polarized for a half cycle, right? Because if my light is circularly polarized, this never happens. This happens, and it misses, never interacts with the core. 
So this is extremely sensitive. All the process we talk about today in terms of rescattering is extremely sensitive to polarization. All right, I'm going to run out of time here, Mariano. Let me tell you how to measure it. Okay, uh, here's how you measure a pulse tray. One way you, you can measure a pulse tray. It's a technique known as rabbit, very docile animal. Uh, so say I, I think I made an attosecond light pulse, and I shine it on an atom, okay? That, that's, and I'm going to look at the electrons coming off that atom. I'm going to energy resolve them, okay? So let's think about a single frequency. So I have a single frequency that's ionized in this atom, and this is just the photoelectric effect. I get a, an electron uh, with, that carries off the excess energy, and I measure that. Now, if I put in an infrared field, a low-frequency field, in fact, the field that's making this harmonic, okay, just put a little bit of that light in at a reasonable intensity, but still within perturbative limits, then what happens? I amplitude modulate this outgoing electron, okay, such that I generate sidebands in the photoelectron spectrum. So now I have a dressed electron uh, that is dressed by a two-photon uh, two absorption. I have the initial photoelectron peak. I have uh, uh, an electron peak dressed down by one photon optical photon, and dressed up by one photon, okay? But my harmonics, so now here's my harmonic, and here's the next odd order, okay, are separated by two omega. So this harmonic will also be dressed in this field and produce sidebands. And in this cartoon here, then, uh, at this particular energy, the sideband from this harmonic Q and this harmonic Q plus two uh, will have a degenerate energy, okay? And therefore, the amplitude of this sideband, I have two uh, pathways to the same degenerate state. So in quantum mechanics, the, 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 the amplitude is gonna interfere, okay? And so it, this sideband intensity is going to oscillate. It's going to depend upon the delay between my optical field and the pulse train. I control that very easily by just building delay lines, okay? We know how to do that. And it's going to depend upon the difference in phase, the spectral phase, between this harmonic and this harmonic. And this particular phase here contains a lot of good information, okay? It contains the phase difference between these two frequencies, but it also contains all the contributions of the phase due to the atomic terms or the molecular terms, whatever you're looking at here. And that's where all the at-the-second dynamics are extracted out of this term here. So you actually go in the laboratory and do this. You have a harmonic comb, right? Of course, you have a pulse train. All these harmonics are ionizing some target atom. You're analyzing the electron energy coming off from that atom. And then you vary the delay between the at the second pulse train and the IR field or whatever frequency is driving it. And you record that. So this is just delay versus harmonic energy. So each line out here is a harmonic spectrum. These bright uh, uh, lines here are just the, um, are the harmonics themselves. And then the sidebands you see are oscillating. And they're oscillating at 2 omega. Okay? And what matters then, if you want to measure at the second dynamics, is not necessarily the oscillation of the sideband, but the relative set, uh, oscillation between different sidebands, okay? So here's now what the experiment looks like. Uh, you shine light, your fundamental field in, uh, you split a little bit, you take it down a delay arm, 
the other light, you focus into this harmonic jet, you do this spectral and spatial filtering that we talked about, then uh, you get rid of the fundamental light and the low order harmonics, uh, it hits some focusing mirror, and you focus it into, say, a photoelectron spectrometer, okay, that you can do energy analysis. The rest of the light comes down the second arm, and that's just the fundamental light, which you recombine with the at the second or high harmonic comb. So if I block this arm, then I just see the harmonic spectrum that is replicated in the photoelectron distribution, the photoelectron effect, right? I mean the photoelectric effect for a comb of harmonics. That's what I see here. Of course, their amplitude reflects also the cross-section of the atom that's being ionized or the molecule. But I know, I know all those cross-sections from like synchrotron measurements and calculation. So th that, that isn't a big problem. Um, and then if I let in this arm, then I record the spectrogram by varying delay, right? So we actually control the delays with at the second position by just using wedges of glass. And we move them, we insert them into the beam and introduce a delay without adding any additional dispersion to the light or negligible amount of dispersion. And we can control the, the, the delay down to at the second precision as long as mechanically our inferometers are stable enough. Our, our, our inferometers aren't passively stable to at the seconds they're stable to about 75 at the seconds, but then what you do is you use a, a reference field and you can stabilize, actively stabilize your mirrors and get down to kind of approaching the atomic unit of time. Okay, and you get this spectrogram and here you can see all those oscillating sidebands over a broad energy range. And I don't know if you tilt your head right, you may notice that those oscillations are not in phase. There's a tilt to them. And that tilt is uh, a measure of at the second dynamics. And let me show you one of those measurements, just kind of compiling that sort of data. So here are measurements. So we extract the phase. So what you do is you fit those oscillations, right? And you just, one, you, we do them by various means of analysis. But we fit those oscillations and then plot their relative phase as a function of energy. And those are the data points you see here. And the solid lines are the classical predictions. So that's the atto chirp, what we call the atto chirp. This is the atto chirp for the short trajectory. And you can see the data seems to follow it reasonably well. And this is showing it at different colors that indeed uh, the atto chirp could be extracted from this sort of measure. So I'm going to skip this. Um, I'm almost finished. Up. This is there are techniques uh, for measuring the isolated pulse known as streaking techniques. Uh, they work differently than that rabbit since you're, you're, you're now looking at a broadbanded isolated uh, pulse. Uh, but in fact, uh, this technique we have applied since the um, XFELs are broadbanded isolated pulse. Unfortunately, not like these pulses that we make in our laboratory, which are fully longitudinally coherent. We don't have that nice structure in uh, XFELs. Plus, we also have this other annoying uh, problem that we can't synchronize anything with high precision to the XFEL. So if I want to use a reference field, the reference field is kind of bouncing about with some random fluctuations. But OK, we can get around that somehow. Uh, and, uh, and these streaking techniques have worked uh, very well on XFELs. Okay, this is the Krauss experiment. So let me, can I have five more minutes? Well, I can end here, because these are just applications. Yeah, I know, I know. 
I was almost done. <laughs> no, I'm sorry to cut you off, Lou. Um, do we have questions for Lou um, right now? Um, and you can talk more if you want later, but maybe you can take questions now. Uh, I have a question, though. Uh, so that, yeah, so this, this uh, poor, poor man's model, no, um, Simple man's simple, model. Simple, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, does that explain, so say if you were to come with circularly polarized light, uh, then you turn off all the recollision processes, right? Yeah. So then the photoelectron spectrum Becomes will be like, basically that, the, the simple man's model. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's slightly different because of the tunneling rate, mm -hmm. but it's still bound between zero and two UP. Okay. The difference is if you go the circularly polarized light within the simple man model, it actually, the electron distribution peaks at one UP, not mm -hmm. zero. Okay. So you get this kind of bell-shaped distribution peaked at one UP mm -hmm. and bound between zero and two. Okay, good. And, and then the, since I, saw, I don't see hands rising, uh, the, uh, the, the, the shape of the uh, this spot that you get out of the short and long trajectories, mm -hmm. Uh, is it a, way, a simple way to explain why, is, is it like a, like a, can I think of it as a different source with a different emittance and it yeah. gives me... In fact, that, that, that's exactly how you should think about it, yeah. Uh -huh. Is that uh, because they have different coherence right, times, the, the, yeah. they, they are different sources with, with different divergence. So, right. Okay. Um, yeah, th 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 that's exactly. And then, so the phase bathroom reinforces the short trajectory because of its longer coherence time on axis. Mm -hmm. In fact, the long trajectories have uh, zero uh, intensity on along axis. the forward direction or the long, the zero direction. Okay, good. So they look more like a donut mode. Right, right, it looks like it, yeah. Matthias? So in the three-step model, the, the photon emission is basically fluorescent. Right. The, it, the photon emission is fluorescent, right? Fluorescent? Well, you you scatter back and then uh, no, you no, recombine. No, it, no, it's coherent. So it's, it's coherent. A, it's stimulated emission. It is stimulated emission in this case. It's stimulated. I mean, think about it. There's no fluorescence that's going to occur over a femtosecond. Right. Right. That that it, it's coherent. It's stimula. It's stimulated emission. Thank you. Uh, I got a question about the when you add the inner aperture that it become at a second. Uh, I mean, from the perspective of Fourier transfer, I understand. But you know, when you physical, it, because the pulse length is longitudinal, right? So you just cut, you know, transversely. I have a hard time to imagine how to, you know. So, so you you're, you're asking that by putting the pinhole. Uh, the, yeah, the aperture and then the pulse become at a second. So yes. You, that, uh, so. Um, and, and again, that's just because that the short trajectory is projected and amplified by uh, uh, phase matching along that forward direction. So by putting the aperture, you're throwing away photons, right? Because there's, but those photons are uninteresting to you because they'll mess up the phase on target where you want to do the at the second pulse. Okay, thank you. Right here, Mark. I, I can just yell. Um, okay. I, I, I I'm guess close I, enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, I had a question about the phase matching. Just like, could you go into a little more detail as to why the short trajectory is phase matched and the long trajectory is not phase matched? And um, mm -hmm. if there's a simple picture for that. Well, you know, phase matching means that your, right, your wave vectors uh, are going to. Um, the delta k is going to be zero. That's perfect phase matching, right? So perfect phase matching means basically I can uh, continue to grow exponentially, coherently, over an infinite uh, distance. Okay, but what limits you in 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 phase matching is the coherence time of your pulse. So although uh, your delta k may be zero. If the coherence time, the colors, the phase is a function of time, um, then uh, you will have limited distance at which you can phase match. So that's why people use things like quasi-periodica. I'm not sure 
if any of you know about engineering for second harmonic generation or third harmonic generation quasi-periodic structures where you change sign uh, by, engineering, uh, um, by engineering the material. The, so the same thing's true here. The uh, short trajectory, because it has this longer coherence time, because it's not propagating as long, right? So it's not accumulating as much phase from the field and has a different phase dependence, uh, different, I'm sorry, different intensity dependence than the long trajectory, limits for the long trajectory the uh, useful phase matching uh, distance that you can have in your medium. Okay? In fact, we're, we're always limited in either case, short or long, by absorption, right? Because uh, by the medium itself. So the medium length of these sorts of, uh, sam uh, of these type of uh, sources are on the order of, well, a millimeter of useful. I mean, you can make it longer, but you'll just absorb your radiation. Yes. Well, yes, that's right. That, so, well, I mean, you bring up another important point. I mean, the macroscopic part is always uh, something I don't like talking about because it's so uh, difficult to understand. But typically, you're in a loose focusing condition. So you have plane waves across your uh, sample size. But in other cases, you might use tight focusing. Uh -huh. to, conversion of 100%. <laughs> no, it's uh, very small. Very small. Just like we saw with the elastic cross section, right? How, especially if you want to go the higher and higher energy photons, uh, the cross section. So the, re the same thing happens to the recombination dipole, right? This recombination. Um, so the conversion efficiency, if you make a very optimal source in the XUV range, 30 volts, or I don't know what to call it, or VUV, uh, you can get conversion, conversion efficiencies as high as 10 to the minus 4 have been reported. But more typically, the conversion efficiency at higher frequency is like 10 to the minus 6. Uh, laser plasma sources? Well, laser plasma sources, first of all, it's an incoherent light, and it, it's not forward scattered. Don't forget, this is a coherent beam. You know where it is. It's not in the 2 pi, okay? So it's, it's much brighter spectrally than that. Uh, so in terms of, like, actual research facilities who use attosecond light pulses, I know that there's one facility being built in Hungary, the Eli Alps uh -huh, attosecond yes. facility. And so they really will have like beam lines for users with attosecond uh, time scales. Yeah, scales. I mean, the, the Eli Alps is a very special facility. So I don't know who said this morning about some people like to drive trucks or, okay. That, that, that's uh, uh, people in the optical regime that decided they wanted a truck. But typically, uh, and so it's going to do very special things, okay. Um, it's going to use very intense drivers. In fact, they're, they're looking beyond the harmonic I told you about or what we refer to as gas phase high harmonics, of course, they're from this rarefied sample. But you can also get harmonics if you push the light onto a solid sample. Okay, these are very different harmonics, okay. Uh, so Eli Alps is kind of uh, trying to push those frontiers. Also very high average power. So we can do this in our laboratory. We can generate these at the second pulses easily at a few kilohertz repetition rate. Uh, a, a kilohertz laser can generate sufficient energy to drive these harmonic sources. Okay, uh, 100 kilohertz or you know a megahertz becomes a challenge, and Eli Alps is developing technology to drive these sources to extremely high average power. Um, any more questions now that I found the microphone? And... No? Okay. Uh, we have to, well, let's thank Lou again. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.